Behold, I am in the booth with you, the booth of truth. And we're in the book, The Politics of Guilt and Pity, uh, the fourth section thereof. Approaching the end, we're in the sixth chapter of eight chapters in the final section. The title is in chaptered, The Biblical Doctrine of Government. 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 Thirteen, so... I might even split this into two. We'll see. Six. The Biblical Doctrine of Government. One of the most revealing and deadly linguistic errors of our time is the equation of the word government with state. When the average person, and indeed almost every man, hears references to government, he immediately thinks of the state. This usage is a relatively modern one. There was a time when, in common usage, especially among the Puritans, the term for the state was civil government. Government in itself was a much broader concept. Government meant, first of all, the self-government of the Christian man. The basic government is self-government, and only the Christian man is truly free and hence able properly to exercise self-government. A free social order rests on the premise that self-government is the basic government in the human order, and that any weakening of or decline in self-government means a decline in responsibility and the rise of tyranny and slavery. Second, next to self-government is another basic form of government, of government. I don't know, government, I don't know. Maybe government, I don't know. Second, next to self-government, is another basic form of government, the family. The family is man's first state, church and school. It is the institution which provides the basic structure of his existence and most governs his activities. Man is reared in a family and then establishes a family, passing from the governed to the governing in a framework which extensively and profoundly shapes his concept of himself and of life in general. Third, the church is a government and an important one, not only in its exercise of discipline, but in its religious and moral influence on the minds of men. Even men outside the church are extensively governed in each era, even if only in a negative sense, by the stand of the church. The failure of the church to provide biblical governments has deadly repercussions on a culture. Fourth, the school is a government, and a very important one. The desire of statists to control education rests on the knowledge of the school's significant parts in the government of man. <coughs> 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 Wowzers. Whoa. For formal education to be surrendered to the state is thus a basic surrender of man's self government. Fifth, a man's vocation, his business, work, profession, or calling, is an important government. A man is governed by the conditions of his vocation or work. In terms of it, he will educate himself, uproot his family and travel to another community, spend most of his waking hours in its service and continually work therein to attain greater mastery and advancement. Vocations are both areas of government over man and, at the same time, a central area of self-government. It's interesting that the fascia, it's as if the fascia in your body gets a shock wave down to your, um, the nether regions, you know what I mean? There's a shock tightening in the sneeze and that must 
echo through your fascial lines, whatever, to whatever focal point is affected by that head movement. Hmm, that is interesting. Sixth, private associations are important forms of government. They include a man's neighbourhood, his friends, voluntary organisations, strangers he must meet daily, and other like associations. A man dresses, speaks, thinks and acts in an awareness of these associations with a desire to be congenial, to further a given faith or cause or to enhance his social status. These associations have a major governing influence on man, but they can also be means in areas whereby he exercises his government over others, influencing. Influencing or directing them. Seventh, another area of government is civil government, or the state. The state is thus one government among many, and to make the state equivalent to government per se is destructive of liberty and of life. The governmental area of the state must be strictly limited, lest all government be destroyed by the tyranny of one realm. The issue in the persecution of the early church was the resistance of the Christians to the totalitarian claims of the state. Mm. Boy. The Christians were asked to sacrifice to the genius of the emperor, that is, to offer incense to him. This, in its earlier forms, was not a recognition of the deity of the emperor, because only the dead emperor was deified upon approval of the senate. It was a recognition that the state, in the person of the emperor, was the mediating and governing institution between the gods and men, and that all life and government was under the jurisdiction of the state. Religious liberty was available to the church upon recognition of that premise. I don't know why I screamed premise. The Roman Empire, in other words, like the modern state, assumed that it had the right to deny or grant religious liberty because religion, like every other sphere of human activity, was a department under the state. The church denied this. Christians defended themselves as the most law-abiding citizens and subjects of the empire, ever faithful in prayer for those in authority, but they denied the right of the state to govern the church. The church, directly under God, cannot submit itself to any government other than that of Jesus Christ. This was the issue. Abuses of order within the church are no more under the government of the state than abuses within the state are under the government of the church. And the same is true of every other realm of government, family, church, school, business and the like. Reformed theologians restricted the right of rebellion against an unjust order within the state to a legitimate order within that state, that is, to other civil magistrates who, in the name of the law, moved to correct the abuses of civil order. Civil order. <laughs> the various spheres are interlocking and interdependent and yet independent. Thus, Deuteronomy 21, 18-21 deals with the death penalty for a juvenile delinquent. The parents do not have the power of the sword, that is, of capital punishment. 
Upon reporting the incorrigible nature of their son to the city elders, the parents carried their governmental authority to its limits. The elders, upon confirmation of the charges, then assumed their jurisdiction, capital punishment for what was now, upon report, a civil offence. Clearly, the various spheres do not exist in a vacuum. They are interlocking, but the integrity of each is nonetheless real. The resistance of the Church to taxation is based on this independence. The Church is an independent sphere and kingdom, and, although residing within a state, it is not a part of that state, it has extraterritorial status. How stupid wake up! It is comparable to a foreign embassy. The law of the Church alone is applicable on that soil. The Roman Catholic Church, better than Protestantism, has understood the implications of maintaining this extraterritorial status. The existence of the Church as a Church is at stake. Similarly, biblical law did not recognise the legitimacy of a land tax because a land tax destroys the independence of every sphere of government and makes each and every sphere subordinate to the state. The land, in biblical law, was free from taxation. Rand's summary is accurate. It was impossible to dispossess men of their inheritance under the law of the Lord, as no taxes were levied against land. Regardless of a man's personal commitments, he could not disinherit his family by being dispossessed of his land forever. Millions of people today have no inheritance in the land and are pauperised in a country where hundreds of thousands of acres of land lie idle and unused. <laughs> what? Evil. Because taxes are levied against the land instead of being levied against the increase from that land, men cannot afford to possess land. Through a system of debt that impoverishes the many and <clears throat> through a system of debt that impoverishes the many and enriches the few, the tendency has been to dispossess the many in our refusal to keep the law which states that ye shall not therefore oppress one another, and we penalize through taxation those who should inherit the land. The tithe was the original pattern of all taxation. It was a tax on increase, or production, on income. A man paid a double tithe annually to the Lord's work for charity and to rejoice before the Lord with his family. The religious tithes were of three kinds. First, an annual tithe of the increase was claimed by God, Leviticus 27, 30-33, and was to be given to the Levites, Numbers 18, 21 to 24. The second tithe, Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 27, was again of the yearly increase of the land and was to be used at the place of worship to eat and rejoice before the Lord. The third tithe, Deuteronomy 14, 28 following, every third year only, was to be laid up at home. This tithe was to be shared by the local Levite, the stranger, the fatherless and the widow. Thus, religious duty, holiday and charity were taken care of by the tithe. <laughs> holiday. Ah, now that's interesting. Holidays and tithes go together. My, my. That's a revelation. That is. Revelations what you need. I want to be best, even better than other people. Revelation, what you need? It your revelation. The words tithe and tax were once equivalent. 
they referred also to the same thing, a tax on increase. When God is declaring to Samuel the implications of apostasy outlined the course. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I mistook a word, I tripped myself up. When God, in declaring to Samuel the implications of apostasy, outlined the course of tyranny and totalitarianism, he stated that it would lead directly to a land tax, 1 Samuel 8, 14 and 15, and a personal property tax, 1 Samuel 8, 15 and 17. It would also involve forced labour as a tax, 1 Samuel 8, 13 and 16. The subsequent history of Israel and Judah confirmed this abundantly. The land was divided for purposes of taxation, 1 Kings 4.7, forced labour as a tax came into being, 1 Kings 5.13, and confiscation of property, also predicted, 1 Samuel 8.14 came to pass, 1 Kings 21. The land tax became an arm of royal power, 2 Kings 23.25, and so on. <clears throat> the basic premise of the tithe is the oft-repeated declaration that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Exodus 9.29, Deuteronomy 10.14, Psalm 24.1, 1 Corinthians 10.26, etc. A tax on the land, therefore, is a tax against God. This is not lawful. God's earth cannot be taxed, but man's labour, his increase, production or income, can be taxed by both God and man, hence the tithe. By restricting taxation to production, the Bible restricted severely the powers of the state and preserved the liberty of the family, the merchants, the church and every other order of life. According to 1 Samuel 8, the means to totalitarianism to an absolute state will always be the extension of taxation to land, personal property and inheritance. Today, by means of this anti-Christian concept of taxation, the state has gained jurisdiction over every area of life. The state treats religious liberty itself as something it can grant or deny. The tax exemption of the church is treated as a state-bestowed privilege, and some question is... and some question... <laughs> and some question its advisability or deny it. Meanwhile, anti-Christian churchmen demand the destruction of the church by pleading for the taxation of the church. In this rise to totalitarian power, the state has smoothed its way at every turn by claiming to act in behalf of man as a representative of the people. In the name of man, the state has usurped the place of God it has then turned on all men to demand a tax of them as Lord of the earth, as the very Creator. God, while claiming ownership, demanded no land and property tax, only a tithe of the increase. The integrity of his creature, man, was thus preserved as God's image bearer. <laughs> Judgments could be the outcome or blessing the reward, but man's course was man's choice. The state denies man the liberty which the Creator grants man. Under God, man is responsible and therefore liable to judgment. Under the caretaker's state, man is not responsible, nor is he free, for the state alone is free, 
and the state supplants responsibility with cradle-to-grave security. The state's, in the name of the people and as their ostensible representative, robs the people of their God-given heritage. Its first step in this process is to convince the people that the state is their representative and agent, Then, in the name of the majority, or better, the general will as interpreted by the state, the state takes over all governments, it controls or owns the earth, and it plays at being God. Mm. Wow, this left nostril is opening up. Wow, that's great. Ah, Wow. Wow. Okay. I think I'm going to end there, although it's super short, super short recording, but that's okay. Um, The uh, point of all this talking in a booth of truth is to uh, record all of Rush Dooney's, pardon me, audiobooks, bar a couple, and um, which is perhaps... 5,000 pages, probably more like six or 7,000, I think it's 7,000. Chapters, pardon me, not pages, chapters, what am I talking about? Of uh, often quite dense prose. Um, yeah. So if you want to support this work, give me a little pat on the back, a little clap for the NHS, thank you very much. Then do consider giving. You can give at nathanteacher.com forward slash donations or you can just go to, where would you like to go to? You can just give me a like, give me a share, all that kind of stuff. That would encourage me. Look at me with my finger. Finger. Thank you very much and hope to see you for the second part of this chapter.